we are in the, the book of Esther, and we are unpacking the book of Esther by character. We are not going just kind of verse by verse, but we're really unpacking Esther um, by its characters. Last week, we stepped into the character of Vashti. This week, we step into the, um, to the character of King Xerxes, who is, um, who is the king of kings back in this era. Um, my thing's not working. You're going to have to advance that. Sorry. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at Xerxes in all of his kind of maniacal craziness. We're going to take a look and see what's going on in his world and um, kind of measure it up and see what we think of such a powerful king. So Xerxes, let's just kind of do a dossier on him, okay? King Xerxes is a historical figure. All right, so if you know King Xerxes, he would be the great Persian Empire's king, okay, the final king in the Eastern Empire of Persia, and they would have the Greco Wars, the, the Greek Wars that went against the Persian Empire. This would have been Xerxes versus like the Spartans. Remember in, in uh, the movie 300, the Battle of Thermopylae? This would have been King Xerxes who would have led his troops. King Xerxes was a different cat in every way. He was the last, as I said, great king of Persia. And one of the cool things about Xerxes is that in his power, he oversaw 127 provinces that span from India, Ethiopia, right down all around there, all the way up to Turkey. Now, that's hard enough to do in modern times with email and different things. Can you imagine what it took to be Xerxes back in the day around 450 B.C.? Xerxes was king of kings, commander of the world's largest army numerically. When he went against Greece, there are records, and, and we think they're pretty inflated, but there are records of three to five million troops in some sections, but it was more likely, you know, between 100 and 500,000 armed soldiers at his, at his command in the ancient world. So he was an amazing king, and he really had um, the, the throw of the world. But here's the deal. Part, oh, man, Xerxes was a drinker. He was a partier. He had a good time. In Xerxes' day, in Xerxes' court, at the opening of the book of Esther, what do we see? It says Xerxes threw a party for 180 days. It's like Thanksgiving piled on everything else, right? That's 180 days. And at the end of that, then he threw just a bender and they did a seven-day drinking party. So he was excessive in every way. And when he threw this 180-day party or this banquet, it was to prepare for the invasion of Greece. It was all the nobles and military commanders. So he's this partier extraordinary. He's incredibly excessive. Here's how excessive he was. In the first chapter of Esther, we find out Xerxes had, um, gave as much wine to the people in the garden, so in the citadel of Susa, the capital, he gave everybody a golden cup that was kind of custom made to themselves. It's like a red solo cup when you put your name on it, right? You shouldn't know what that meant by that. All right, so um, he does this golden goblet for everybody. He's excessive, he's impulsive, and he's highly, highly driven to be the greatest. Even though he is the king of kings, he's blindly ambitious, and he will not take no for an answer. If you wonder how that works, I mean, think of this. Queen Vashti in chapter one said no to him when he had been drinking for seven days and then decided, I want to show all the nobles how good looking my wife is. And he said, come in, let's just walk in front of us. Wives, how's that going to go, right? She was like, yeah, no X. I'm not doing it. And she said no. And then what did he do? He handled it very well. He deposed her from the throne and never saw her again and sent her off into exile. It's a little Henry VIII, isn't it? It's a little macabre. He is hot-tempered. He is really impulsive. And he's going to do what Xerxes wanted, wants to do. He is this kind of crazy, maniacal person. We see this come to light in some of the scriptures. Just listen to some of these. This is just a smattering about him from the book of Esther's. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions for seven days. For the king instructed the wine stewards to serve everyone all that they wanted. The next little quote, on the seventh day, when Xerxes was high in spirits, he asked for his wife to come forward and parade in front of everybody. 
Then he deposes her, as I said, and gets rid of her. And then he has all the women of 127 provinces from India to Turkey to Ethiopia to be paraded before him, all the young women, to see which one he would like. And while he's doing that, he shares his chamber, uh, it's a euphemism, a chamber, every night with a different one, just kind of whatever Xerxes wants, right? And then he finds and this from Scripture, that uh, Esther was more attractive than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other girls. He was so excited about this that he declared a national holiday. I don't know if it was called Esther or what, but it was a holiday, and then he distributed gifts to all provinces, liberally, generously giving gifts to all the provinces. The very next chapter is when someone comes to the new Queen Esther, who he loved so much that he made a holiday and sent gifts to 130 places, that they said, hey, can you go to the king? And she says, I can't. I haven't seen him for 30 days. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're good with that. Okay, I hope your honeymoons were as magical as that just sounded. Because that, I mean, you need relational counseling, don't you? I love you so much. About a month? Hmm. You know, like who does that? This is a weird guy. He is crazy impulsive and he does not really take instructions from anyone else. So as we look at this, we see that he gets this weird kind of temperamental moody way, even to the point that when Esther does come before King Xerxes, he likes her again so much. This is after the 30 days. He likes her so much that he's like, I'll give you half the kingdom. She's like, how about a half a day, Right? Just spend some time. But he's like, I'll give you whatever you want. He's kind of a nut. And he's completely impulsive. And we have to take a look at Xerxes. And we're going to do this in some detail. And we're going to kind of move forward from there. But the way I want to frame this is I want to hold up the craziness of Xerxes that I just showed you. And then jump ahead to the Apostle Paul and read a scripture from Galatians chapter 5. Because I believe this shows... I don't know that Paul had Xerxes in mind when he wrote this, but I do think it points back to the kind of person he was and the person he was called to be. So I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your body. Okay, and by the way, Galatians is written about 500 years later, after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. It was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia, um, which would have been in Asia Minor, Turkey, that kind of area. Um, for the, the body desi uh, desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the body. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the body are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Pretty much sounds like 187 days Xerxes had, right? Um, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Seriously, it's like Paul went, what did he do? What did Xerxes do for 180 days? I'll write that down. That's all that went on. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. Against such things, there are no laws. Those who belong to Christ have been crucified, and their body with its passions and desires are crucified as well. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Today we're going to talk about control. Xerxes wants total control of everything. Just think about the dude's mood swings. Think about it. He deposes one king. He falls madly in love with another one, ignores her for a month. Like, anybody want to be married to that guy? He's got a great title. I have a nice house. It's a little rough emotionally, but I'm good. No? I mean, he's moody. He's grumpy. When Here's, here's just a macro version of it. He built the first ocean-going war fleet. And he took tens of thousands of troops across the Mediterranean to invade Greece. They came around a, a point. I can't remember the name of the point, but it's on the, on the Greek Isles. They came around and a huge storm brewed up. These are wind-powered sailboats and then oars. And the boats were dashed against the rocks. He lost tens of thousands of troops that day. And do you know what he said? Build it again. 
build a bunch of new ships again, get a bunch of new bodies, put them on it, we're going to Greece. He didn't care. He was this moody zealot who is blindly ambitious. He wants total control of everything, yet we look, if we look at him closely, he lacks self-control. And how much do we despise someone who wants to control everything but has no self-control, right? Someone who's constantly kind of overseeing and doing all these things, and he's changing wives as quickly as he does sandals. He's giving gifts with great liberality and executing people in mass. You never really know what you're going to get with Xerxes. He's incredibly moody, and he has no restrictions. Again, go back to the 187 days. He was supposed to have a war council over that 180 days. It was a feast. It was a banquet. It was not first designed as a war council, or it was designed as a war council and became a feasting banquet. Everybody went home wearing stretchy pants because all they did was eat and drink. It was like Thanksgiving, where you borrow your wife's maternity pants. Nobody else? I don't care. I did it, and it was great. All right. Um, This is what it was like. He has total control over everybody else and no control over himself. He lacks any self-control. It reminds me of the words of the, of the writer of Proverbs. Like a, city's who, a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. You want to hear a cool ironic bit about this? Xerxes is the king when Nehemiah, the Jewish exile, was the cupbearer. The guy who brought him all his wine. Um, when, when Nehemiah was the cupbearer, he went in and Xerxes is like, why are you so sad? Because my city, Jerusalem, and its walls are in ruins. And he said, well, let's send you back and rebuild the walls. Let's go rebuild those walls. But Xerxes has no boundaries in his own personal life. And his life is like a city whose walls are broken down. He lacked self-control. He controlled everything else, but he literally had no self-control. He controlled others. If you look at the way he controlled Vashti, if you don't let me drink for 180 days and then call you in to parade you in front of my nobles and be nothing more than a pretty face and a seductive dance, then I'm going to divorce you. I think most wives would be like, okay, where do I sign? But he controlled her. And then he ripped the crown off her head, gave it to one more beautiful than she, and moved on like nobody's business. He controlled her. He controlled his subjects. When he arrayed his battle, his army, for the big battle in Greece, one of the first big battles, and they're out on this huge plain, and it said that the Greeks looked on, because the Greeks took great notes, they looked on and they saw people from every tribe and every color under heaven and wondered, who is this we're up against? He controlled his subjects maniacally. He didn't care. He got everything out of him he could. He controlled the Jewish people who were in exile under him. He controlled Haman, his henchman. Mordecai would not be controlled by him, but he would seek that, constantly seeking to control other people. The big lack in his life, in Xerxes' life, is he refused to recognize this one basic truth, that God is in control. God is in control. And if we lose that truth, there's this reality when he loses the truth that he is not the king of kings, he is a bit player in God's party, then he begins to live to all excess with no personal control while controlling a vast empire. Like when you look at the book of Esther, you can see God is in control. But here's a cool thing about Esther. Esther reads more like a Shakespearean play. I really, really hope that one day somebody with good chops in Hollywood like, like, and somebody who, who loves the Lord makes Esther into a movie. It'd be a phenomenal movie. But one of the problems is it never mentions God. You're like, but it's in the Bible. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't it mention God? Because one of the realities is the ever-present providential hand of God is steering the kings of the earth, to do his will. It shows God's providence and the truth of that. And it reminded me of this scripture, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and God will turn it wherever he will. Who here saw my big fat Greek wedding? Anybody? A number of years back, it was so good. Who here craved lamb for a while after that? Anybody else? I know, I was just like, I don't know why, but I want to eat a sheep. But um, okay, so there's, sorry, um, (laughs) Sometimes you just want to hit the lead on your own tongue. Um, so you have my big fat Greek wedding. And do you remember the husband? He's like, the man is the head. The man is the head. I can't do a good Greek accent. I apologize. Um, but, but what did his wife say? The man is the head. 
but the wife is the neck and she turns it whichever way she wants, right? And you're like, I don't appreciate that. Um, Think of it. Doesn't that kind of read like that? The king's head is attached to the neck and the Lord turns it whichever way he wants. The king's head, the king may be a figurehead, but he is attached to the sovereign hand of God and God will turn it whichever way he wants. That's what this scripture is saying. The king's heart is a stream of water and it's in the hand of the Lord and he will direct it however he wants. And it tells us this, that Xerxes is actually just a bit player in the own drama of his life. He is not the central figure. The truth is that he is one of God's subjects doing what God will for God wills for God's purposes in this earth. So what we have to do is now take the, the character of Xerxes. Let me ask a question. Who here thinks Xerxes is a jerk? Anybody? Okay, so you'd like Xerxes to be your president? Who here likes Xerxes? Anybody? Who here doesn't like Xerxes? Let's get a show of hands. All right, this is where I'm very cruel to you by making you participate in your own demise. All right, so what we have to do is take Xerxes and be like, it's universally voted. You're kind of a jerk and you're self-absorbed and you probably should go to AA. (laughs) It's just a given. So that's Xerxes. What if we just open the book and say, what if we change his name to your name or my name? What if we change the name from King Xerxes to you? Are you like Xerxes? Are you looking for total control of everything but lacking self-control? Do we have any moody people in the room today? Like if you ask my wife and kids, to be like, yeah, Eric's, I'm happy and I'm go lucky, but I'm moody. If you were ever on a mission trip with me in Vertigo and you crossed my path, I was like, heads will roll. I get moody. I, you know, you have this bright, happy side, but there's also, and I'm not like a deeply dark person sitting in a closet sharpening knives or anything, but I have a dark side too where I just want to control and, and I, get, I get a little dark and a little moody. My kids would say sometimes, we don't know why, but dad gets a little barky. What are you doing? Who put that dish in the sink? You did. Don't talk to me that way. Like, that's how it goes. It's not always, you know, I try to be a nice person, but sometimes I fail miserably. I'm I'm a moody person at times. The staff, I just found this out this past week, so I'm judging them wherever they are with my eyes, because we were talking, and they kind of agreed that there's a certain way I come in the door, and I get Eric's not to be joked with today. I'm like, I am fun-loving and wonderful. You know, like, how dare you act like I'm a jerk? But the reality is that for me, probably like you, I want to control a bunch of things, and I lack self-control. In my own life, I lack self-control. I can be given to not wanting any restrictions. When I'm my worst self controlling everything and not myself, I want no restrictions over what I eat or how I act. And my question for you is, how does this begin to look like you? For me, I know how it begins to look, Um, and it's strange because I've lived in Zealand for um, almost 19 years, and I love it here. It's home. I I love it, but I'm from Southern California. You people need to learn how to drive. You're supposed to be on each other's tail and driving the person in front of you. You're NASCAR. Draft a little for the love, and when you get to a stop sign, do not wave that other person forward. My goodness, you go. You deserved it. You want to see me turn to the darker, moody side? Drive passively. <laughs> like my kids have a hoot with this because I'll be in a stop. I'll be like a four-way stop, and I'm like, "Stop waving! What's wrong with you people?" Someone learn how to drive. People in the cars next to me must be like, oh, that guy's listening to Pantera or ACDC or like Metallica. Because I'm like, I, I'm, I'm freaking out. And they're like, yeah, buddy. And I'm like, no, you're a doorknob too. Because you're not driving. Now get to it. And you too, little old lady. I am sick of the passivity. No, you go. No, you go. You know what? I'm going. I get so. I'll get to church. And I'm like, ah, ah. it's a mile from church to my house, and I may have walked. It's horrifying. I get moody, and I want to control everybody else, right? Now, that may, that's me, and that's kind of sadly true me in a nutshell. But, but what about you? What about you? Where do you get moody? Where do you want to control everything else and have no self-control? Where do you want to remove all restrictions? Are you given to excess in food? In food, like that's a big deal in America. We are given to excess in this country. 
And you think, how? Because if you pull up on your phone, don't do it right now, but um, pull up on your food, phone, places to eat near me. Your phone will populate with tons of places to eat. And then you can go, and my fridge is probably full of food, and my pantry, right? We have tons of things, and we can have no limits. When life is good and we can eat a lot, you lack self-control. I lack self-control at times, given to what we eat, maybe what we drink, Life is good, why not have another beer or two or three or four and well, well, it's seven days later and we're Xerxes. You're like, well, it's not that bad, but are we given to excess? If some is good, s'more is better, to coin an awesome phrase, right? So we have to recognize that in us, there is this reality where we want to control everything and we don't want any restrictions, one of the best ways that's coming up in our culture, it's actually not coming up, it's in full, full force, is um, what we watch. You have somebody who will say, I'm not saying this, I haven't watched it, but they're like, I love Game of Thrones. I know it's bad, I know I shouldn't. And they start excusing it to me and my face has remained passive because I've never seen it or, or read it, so I'm just like, hey, whatever. And so I read a review on it, I'm like, oh, that's why. Because they feel ashamed for talking about something they binge watch and take in. Do you have no restrictions on what you see, on what you take in, on what you watch? Do you excessively absorb entertainment and never attend to the word of God? It's a lack of self-control in the church. Have you ever had a lack of self-control in what you say? Again, back to me driving, right? My children must think that three-fourths of the population of West Michigan is stupid, doorknobs, and other various adjectives that I think are appropriate behind the wheel because I have no control at times over what I say because if I'm in a hurry and somebody else isn't, it drives me nuts and I lose control of my tongue over the stupidest issues. Do we do that? Do you do that at work? Where do you lose control of yourself while trying to control others? Where do you Lose control of yourself while trying to control others. Moms, with your kids, you ever tried to control them and then they embarrass you? You're like, I did not have you grow you, push you out, and have you behave like that. I will have none of it because that's a reflection on me. Right? Dads, how many of you have required that your sons Either be just like you or a better version of you and do all have all the disciplines you never had because you're not going to make those mistakes again through them and you control and manipulate and dominate. Where do you control others and have no self-control? Hear that question with me because it's an epidemic in our lives. Where do you try to control others and have no self-control in your personal life? And why would we as Christians think that's okay? We have to recognize one thing that Xerxes failed to recognize, but after today, hopefully we won't. And it's one central truth. God's in control. This is our Father's world. Jesus Christ died that we would not live and be bound to the passions and desires of our own broken, sinful identity. Jesus Christ died that his purposes and his kingdom could come in this life starting now. Starting right now. God's providential hand has steered many of you to this place today. We trust that for Ryder and Easton, God's providential hand will steer their little and ever-growing lives into men of God to serve and accomplish God's purposes in this world. And the best way we can fail to live into God's purposes is to be beholden to our own impulsive nature, our own inner Xerxes, who demands to control everything and lacks any self-control anywhere. We have to hold on to the fact that maybe God has a plan in this world. Not only maybe God does have a plan in this world, and it was proven to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and in the giving of the Great Commission that we would go and be faithful to him. 
So what we have to do is hold on to the truth. The truth is not relevant. We're in an age of relevant truth. You can turn on CNN and hear one version of truth and Fox News and hear another version of truth and MSNBC and find out that there's aliens doing truth and like all kinds of different things. Everybody's right. Everybody's true. Your truth is fine and my truth is fine. Let's not fight. Let me tell you something. There is but one truth. This is God's world. And in Jesus Christ, it is redeemable. And it is our calling to participate in the coming of the kingdom of God. That is truth. That does not falter or fail. So for us, we recognize that there is this truth that God wants to live it out in us. But who here, and you don't have to raise your hand, but who here is tired of the religious game? Who here is exhausted with trying to be a better person and failing all the time? I am. If you're a gossip and you're in this room, don't raise your hand. (laughs) No one will talk to you afterwards. But if you're a gossip in this room and you walk away from a conversation after ripping someone apart and then being like, but bless their heart, God loves them. (laughs) And you walk off and you walk away thinking, oh my gosh, I did it again. I promised not to gossip and here I am again. Ripping someone apart and they think I'm their friend. See, when we find ourselves in that moment and go, okay, So I have no self-control. What's the answer? Didn't Paul say it for us? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And what is the byproduct of the Holy Spirit living in our lives? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The earmark of the Christian church must be our ability to patiently wait on the sovereign hand of God to move in our life, to recreate us, not into the image of Adam or some greater person, some humanitarian effort, to recreate in us the very identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're tired of pushing to somehow win the religious game and act right, you're gonna fail. But I can tell you this, the Holy Spirit, is the way we have discipline. Without the Holy Spirit, self-control is a delusion of humanity. Without the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit, self-control is literally something that will grow on you as though you were planted out at Crane's Orchard. Oh, got a little apple there. Like, right, you'll grow self-discipline or self-control, not because of you, but because of where you're rooted. Are you rooted in Christ? Are you rooted in the very thing that brings change to this broken life we try to live? Self-control is a delusion if you are not rooted or filled with the Holy Spirit. So, on your sermon board, here's what I want you to do on your clipboard. There's sermon notes. I would love for you to take that little sermon note sheet, and I would love for you to write down, not for me, but for your benefit, some of the areas where you exhibit terrible amounts of authoritarian control and some areas in your life where you absolutely have no self-control. I don't, I don't care what it is. I'm not going to look at it. Maybe Jimmy John's is where you just break down every time you see the commercial, right? You just consume, consume. I don't know what it is. I just know this, that if you will do the work of recognizing where you're trying to control and where you're out of control, you know where to invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life. You know where to invite the Holy Spirit to come and be at work in your life. Because it's one thing for a child to behave without self-control. That's why they have parents. But it's another thing for a mature person to act like a child. We kind of like look at it and think, oh, that's embarrassing. How many of us are supposed to be mature Christians with no self-control. Today, let's just name it. There's a Xerxes that we really don't like living somewhere between here and here, right? And it's time to choose this day who we will serve. Do we want the Spirit of God growing in us the attributes of Jesus, or do we want to keep producing the fruit of this life which leads to emptiness, brokenness, and total loss of self-control? My friends, before you is the choice. How now do we live as Christians, either filled with the Spirit or compromising to everything that sounds good? Pray with me. Come, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would come and speak in such a way that our lives would be reflected with change, that we would no longer be bound to this, um, to this weird 
terrible existence of repetitive sin with no self-control, where we control others, but we never submit to you. God, break us of that, we pray. Speak your words of life into us and transform us from the inside out. God, we can't behave our way out of this, but we can live in relationship with you and be transformed. So that's our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform in us the things we don't know how to fix and make us more into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are a bit of a mess, but we believe even in the brokenness, even in the ruins of our own life, that you, you, God, will raise up something beautiful. So today we confess, we trust you and your providential hand to bring about new life from the ruins. In Jesus' name, amen. I know some of you came for baptism and I kind of yelled at you today. I was going to say I was sorry, but I'm not because I want you to know this one thing. If we begin to believe in our own ability to save ourselves, we'll act like we believe it and we'll be the very worst version of what a Christian should be. But Jesus said these words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus say that? Because those who are poor in spirit know they can't do it on their own. And if we could do it on our, on our own, then Paul wouldn't have written, for you are saved by grace through faith, through no works of your own, but by that of Jesus Christ. We are people saved by grace through faith. And we are spiritually poor in spirit at times because we live in obedience Not because we have to, but because if we don't, we're our own worst enemy. So today I invite you to maybe leave this place a little bit poor in spirit and a lot more dependent on the spirit that lives within you. Let us not be confident in who we think we are. Let us be confident in who he's called us to be. And that is someone transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. As you go about that journey, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in the midst of your transformation. May the peace of Christ rest heavy on you. My friends, you are dismissed. The church must leave the building.